I mean, evolution only happens when people die, or when, when animals die. Evolution has to knock out those that are not fit enough for the change. So you can be evolving something in the background that confers absolutely no ability or, or no, no ability to survive until the environment changes and then suddenly you happen to have something that helps you survive that change better. I've planted my first tree yesterday and that needs watering. And this is a this is a quitter. Like that. Shouldn't really do it when the sun's shining, but so here you can pump uh, groundwater. Correct. Okay. This will be your traditional greenhouse area. Uh -huh. um, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. But it's really tiny. Seeds. This is just for you. Dan. Tiny. How how much will come out of this? You are not used to greenhouses. No. This is enormous. Yeah. This is an absolutely massive greenhouse. A family of 10 would not be able to eat the cucumbers. It's now too late to, to maintain an earth that's suitable for humans. But this particular climate catastrophe, the best possible outcome is that it kills enough people quickly enough uh, for the climate to readjust itself to, to be suitable for those that are left over. And by suitable it means the kind of thing we've evolved over two million years to be a part of. Um, the future will be different. There's, there's no doubt about that, it won't be the same. It's exactly the right size for a tennis court. I want to live in glorious luxury and plenty. And a tennis court is just a total sign of that, really. I don't play, even play tennis. But it's a posh person's sport for posh people with, plenty, with too much ground. What are the main goals? You have to have clean water. Yeah. You have to have... Electricity electricity um, but your uh, own electricity right i'm kind of okay with staying on the grid for a while um, because i don't want to do solar but I'd, ra I'd rather rely more on wind than on solar why oh because wind turbines are essentially very simple mechanical things i can make a wind turbine um, i'm not a super high powered one um, but then i can fix one as well if a solar cell breaks it's broken forever Uh, my thoughts started in the 80s um, when my rather nerdy, mathematical, precocious yeah. teenage brain um, noticed superlatives in weather reports too often. Yeah. And I don't really need the weight of scientific evidence um, in order to persuade me of something. I need some sort of first principle to be mm. wrong. The hottest February on record, uh -huh. the, the wettest July since 1830. And now, you can't go a week without a superlative. Huh. Something's bizarre happening in the environment.
Meine Damen und Herren, willkommen zu 3 Grad Plus. Hello, welcome to 3 Degrees Plus. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Hannes Grasiger. I'm a, I'm a reporter and this is not a conference. Um, I'm a journalist and here we'll do exactly what I do in my research. We'll go and reach out to people and talk to them and some of them have disturbing um, views and um, we'll, we'll let them speak and listen and at the end there will be a chance to discuss. This is a journey into a world moving far beyond two degrees of warming. Um, at least it's into a world, a journey into a world where um, people believe that catastrophic climate change is happening. And here's my big question, how will that change the people if they believe that catastrophe and doom is ahead? Thank you so much, Benjamin Green, for coming here and taking us into your world. Thanks for so, having me. So, Ben, we used to work together. You were a colleague um, at my company in Switzerland, where I work, and we used to chat, and then you sort of disappeared. I found you on a plane, and you told me that you would sell off everything because you had found this hidden former barracks. I know you live there, and do you really believe um, a lot of people will die soon? Oh, um, start with the easy one. Um, I don't know. Um, I think it's... I'm not entirely sure that it's something that I concern myself with much either. Um, I think the thing that uh, interests me, scares me um, much more, is that things just get worse. Um, I'm not too sure that it necessarily ends in, uh, in, in huge amounts of, of death, uh, but I know that it ends in, or it continues, in a, um, in a, in a gradual deterioration of the, the quality of human existence, yeah. So... Can you, can you just describe me the days that you're having now? What are you doing? You're out there yeah. in this like forest. You need like... Yeah, so this is, uh, this is where I live. This is the road coming up to it. Um, I generally tell people uh, how to get there is to uh, go past the last village, turn right, turn left, keep driving through the forest, and when you're absolutely certain you've driven too far, it's like another couple of hundred meters further up. Um, and just around this corner, you'll see it appear, actually. But you're um, so all yeah, alone I'm, on five hectares of land. What are you doing? Yeah, um, it's five hectares of reasonably sterile land. Um, it's not the the most advantageous place to uh, to try and um, develop a self-sufficient lifestyle. Um, so what do I do most of the time? Oh, I'm digging, weeding, watering, um, gardening stuff. Really, um, I made a quite clear ambition to be um, close to self-sufficient within the first two years. Um, popular opinion is that that's impossible, um, but they haven't seen me with a spade. Um, I quite like putting lots of hours. It, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable what you can achieve when you've got nothing else to do. So what, what's, what did you, why did you leave civilization behind? What did you, what was the motivation for you to like quit your well-paid job and yeah. sell uh, off your Well, apartment? that's sort of the wrong angle. Um, I didn't quit my well-paid job. I got a well-paid job in order to finance this. Um, it wasn't um, a flip. It was part of a, I mean, at least 20 year plan. Um, like I said in the in the clip there, um, it's certainly been concerning me since the 80s. Um, but as a, um, as a as a process, it's been going for a long time. Um, so I've got quite a lot of experience of uh, digging up unfertile ground and trying to turn it into something useful. Um, the the other thing, of course, is that. <laughs> It's ever so strange to have someone write about you if, uh, if it's the first time. Um, and in your piece, and, and just now, you kind of said I disappeared. Well, I didn't. I always knew where I was. Um, it's sort of weird to see how other people react to that because I was just doing something I was always going to do. Um, and now I'm doing it and I'm super happy about it. How are these nights? Like, I, I went to visit you twice. Yeah. At the very beginning, it was like minus five degrees, snow yeah. all over. Yeah, you it, didn't have a heating. Yeah, it was just starting to warm up. <laughs> it, it has been cut. Yeah, the first few nights. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, when I say I've been planning this, um, I've been doing more things like the practical stuff on, you know, learning how to grow tomatoes than actual planning. Um, and I, I would advise people to possibly plan it a little bit better if they want to do something like this. Um, I moved in a week before I got the keys. Um, and so for the first week, I was uh, sleeping on the floor of a garage. 
um, with absolutely no heating and, uh, and, and water and electricity and all that fancy stuff. Um, and that, that was cold. Um, it's warmed up a bit now. Um, I've got a little heater in there, which um, is well underpowered for the size of the thing. So it's a it's a former Eastern um, military barracks That's correct, um, yeah. in Saxony uh, and Saxon, and um, there are two houses. How many people could they house technically? The number of um, the number of military they had in there seems to have varied quite a lot. I get a lot of visitors of former soldiers um, who just sort of happen to be passing and want to have a look at it. Um, it seems that there were somewhere between um, about 800 um, and uh, about 1,500 people there at any one time previously. So are you expecting to, to found um, like a new settlement for no. a, a colony of... No, no. Um, don't follow me. That would be a terrible idea. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, I, didn't, I, I always knew that I'd be buying a plot of land. Um, I didn't know what would be on it um, or what it was previously used for. Um, so I found this. Um, by the sort of fairly simple expedient of searching everything that's for sale in Germany um, and filtering it through um, the largest amount of land for the smallest price possible. And it turns out, supply and demand, the supply of barracks might be low, but the demand is even lower. Mm -hmm. um, nobody wants one. Um, the only other people who were vaguely interested in it came and had a look at the um, somewhat decrepit state of the buildings and said, if we're going to do anything with this, we need to stick a million in it. And it really is in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I mean, the, if you wanted to make a hotel out of this, it would have to be a destination hotel, and it doesn't really have the charm and appeal of, of that, maybe. Um, so, yeah, the fact that there's tons of rooms there and this sort of massive infrastructure is just an accident of it being the cheapest, biggest thing I could buy. So, and when I was there, you know... You that could... greenhouse is huge. <laughs> yeah, you, could, you could actually see there's, like... Um, signs of tanks rolling around. Ah, that's, to... that's somewhat more to do with the previous owner. Um, he was a tank fan. So, wait, but did you ever check if the ground is, like, safe and it, it's not toxic at all, you know? No. Why? Um, because, um, here's, sorry about the morbid stuff, we are going to die. Um, I have a supreme advantage of I know where I'm going to die. It's going to be there. Uh, unless it's this weekend, of course. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it's almost certainly going to be there. Um, I've made the decision to, to buy it and grow the food there. Um, it actually takes quite a long time to poison someone to death. Um, also, on the practical... So I'm, I'm going to eat the potatoes that come out of this ground. Simple as that. Um, if I find out that they are in some way... And they contain lead or something... Um, well, I don't know. You only go mad, don't you? It's, What? I don't know. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm being flippant. I am going to live here. I'm going to grow the food and I'm going to eat it. Um, it, you... it will sustain me for a lot longer. So you told me, to kill me. You told me you wanted to leave the nightmare of the future cities behind. What's your vision of life in the cities yeah, in I'm, the near future? Uh, the near future, um, really hard to say. I mean, the, the sort of general worsening of the human experience, of especially living in, in cities, has happened. It's happened, it's started, and you can't get people to admit it because people are like the, the, the lobster in the, in, the, in the kettle, you know. It's, oh, it's a bit warmer, oh, it's a bit warmer, and all of a sudden you've boiled to death. Um, we don't have a very good um, appreciation of a sort of a continuum of stuff. Um, we can just sort of see one step back. Um, if that, I mean, also we're incredibly resilient, um, and we can survive under terrible conditions um, and people will become very good at surviving um, and they will extract a certain amount of pride out of it. You said that horrible thing about rats in the city. Uh, rats in the city, yeah. Um, I mean, I am... Uh, I What do was tend that? To, uh, I, said, um, I said I don't want to stay in the cities uh, when they all start fighting each other for rat meat, um, which, I mean, that's maybe a little hyperbolic. Um, But I don't know that it's impossible. Um, I mean, there is, a, there, there is a problem, especially with food. Um, I mean, you already can't get the sort of range of food you used to be able to get, but people haven't noticed that. Why? What's the example that you see here? Uh, well, bananas uh, is a good one. Um, we're on the world's second best banana. Um, you can only get six to eight different sorts of apples in, in, the, in the supermarkets. Um, in the UK, uh, I'm British. Um, We all eat fish and chips the whole time. We don't, we eat curry, but um, 
um, fish and chips used to be cod in batter with big fat pommies. Right. Um, nobody eats cod anymore. They eat red snapper and things dredged up from the, from the, from the bottom of the ocean because there's no cod. Um, there's not a lot of haddock left either. Um, and people, um, uh, people are pretty okay with that because they've been sold it as a gourmet treat. Ooh, look at this exotic fish. Well, I don't want an exotic fish on cod. I mean, I don't, I'm vegan. So, just your, your mental development, like, um, when did it start that you, like... <laughs> Sorry, you say, when did it like, stop? Sorry. Like, 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 when did you start, like, um, um, taking it seriously, honestly, um, when did it start that you were, like, getting worried or you were noticing climate change? In that short yeah. clip, you said, like, as a teenager, yeah. and then how did that develop from then on? Uh, I mean, it's pretty much as simple as it says in the clip. Um, I don't know that I had a huge mathematical bend, but I did like counting stuff and doing averages and things like that. That sort right. of amused me. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just statistically unlikely that you can get climate superlatives. And they used to be sort of weird ones, like wettest February or mm -hmm. windiest third week of August or August bank holiday or whatever. But now they've just got faster and faster and faster. And this is what I mean about people, the human race not being particularly good at um, following the continuum of their own experience. Um, to, to see the number of superlatives that we see now and convince ourselves that, oh, it's not much worse than it used to be. So back to, back to your personal view. So during the late 90s, right, yeah. or the mid 90s, you still helped the Green Party yeah. in some voluntary way yeah. in the UK. You still thought that whole thing can be somehow you know, fixed? I, th I think then, um, certainly 25 years ago, probably as recently as 15 years ago, mm. yeah, it could have been fixed. When did you give up hope? What was the moment when you feel, when you kind of lost it? You've always, you've always got to be aware that you might be the nutter carrying the sandwich board saying the end of the world is nigh. Um, but I don't know, when, when the numbers got too crazy, I think, 130 gigatons of CO2 need to come out of the atmosphere. You, you, the wildfires in the Arctic, the hurricanes in, 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 in Ireland, everything's just too wrong mm -hmm. and you can't ignore it. Do you think we can still kind of stop it or revert it even? No. Is there still a chance that we might? I, I don't believe so, no. Do you, do you ever, I mean, I know that you read a ton. I know that you're, you, we've, we've been in touch for, for two years or so. Mm. so um, but do you, like, yourself alone on that farm at night when you're, like, looking at the stars yeah. and seeing these, like, empty barracks, yeah. do you sometimes consider you might be wrong? You might err? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, mostly I just consider how beautiful it is. Um, uh, and it is. Um, and I, I'm fine with you know, being quite a long way distant from anyone else. I'm very fine with that. Um, yeah, of course, I might be wrong. Um, but all you need to do then is really just look at the numbers again. So, um, David Wallace Wells. So you're the author of one of the most encompassing current um, reviews um, of the existing climate science around, and you did this great overview of um, where we are right now and what kind of like global warming we're happening, uh, we are heading for. And so um, thank you for coming over. And do you think, do you think my friend Ben is actually nuts? Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I love him, but is he totally wrong? It's, it's like close to my heart because if he's not wrong, then I am wrong. So. Well, he's right that um, the climate is in crisis. He's right that we're living through unprecedented times. Um, the Earth is already warmer than it's ever been in all of human history. So we're walking on a planet that's warmer than any planet that's ever been walked on by humans before. And that means that we developed as biological creatures, we developed agriculture, we developed civilization, modern civilization, under climate conditions that no longer prevail. And we are already living in a world um, governed by different climate rules than we have learned over millions of years to live by. So, but I think, you know, the, I take his continuum point and I, I, um, I look, I, I, 
you look at it in the opposite way, which is to say, I think inevitably we're going to get um, more warming, which will mean more pain and suffering. And um, to those who think that we're not already um, living through pain and suffering, I would say, you know, some estimates for how many people are dying today just from air pollution are as high as 9 million people a year are dying every year. 9 million people from air pollution. And there are scientific estimates showing that much of the developing world has lost as much as a quarter of potential GDP growth over the last few decades already because of the effects of climate change. So we're already suffering. I think inevitably we're going to get a fair amount more suffering. Almost certainly we're going to get a lot more suffering. But I also think how much is an open question. And I see enough difference between a world that's two degrees warmer and a world that's three degrees warmer and a world that's four and five and six and eight degrees warmer that I personally, and this may be my own naivete, but I look at the problem and I think we have to do what we can to stay close to two rather than um, thinking as, as he does, which is, I can't argue with the logic of it, but um, that um, it's all lost. So thanks for almost summarizing a big chunk of your book. Um, but like if I, if I would call my mother and she would ask me, so you've spoken to this journalist who's, who spent three years looking at the existing um, you know, knowledge there, um, and she would ask, how bad is it? What would be the very shortest answer that I would give her from you? Bad. <laughs> so when was, when was the last time that we had such carbon dioxide levels on Earth. We are like around 412 parts per million right now. Do you, do you have that in mind? Well, it hasn't been at any point in human history. I believe it was during the, la the last uh, mass extinction, which was, I think, about uh, 70 million years ago. Ish, yeah. Um, so these, we've, we, you know, you often hear from climate deniers and climate skeptics that the planet's um, climate has changed in the past, the temperatures have been as high or even higher than they are now, the carbon dioxide levels have been as high or higher than they are now, and that's true. But every time that's happened, as much as 60 or 70 percent of all life on Earth has died. Um, and we are now adding carbon to the atmosphere much, much faster than has ever happened in any of those instances, and the temperatures are rising as a result much more rapidly than they rise in any of those episodes. And the worst one, um, in the worst one of those episodes, 97% of all life on Earth died. So it's really as though the entire habitable biological planet was eliminated, and life, practically speaking, had to start all over again. Now, in none of those episodes was there any species as resilient, adaptive, um, innovative as humans are, and I do think that we're likely to engineer through technological innovation, but also psychological adaptation, where we choose to define the suffering of those elsewhere around the world as less important than those close to us. We're going to engineer ways to live in this in this warmed world. That's my personal mm -hmm. sense, um, but it's going to take quite a lot of engineering to even allow that, because the human biological animal was not did not evolve to live under the climate conditions that we have already today. So what I loved so much about your book is that you kind of like broke it down to almost like a personal level, so how it affects us. It's not talking so much about like the Arctic as something very far away, but it's talking about our cities, our bodies. And so um, how will our lives here in the developed world, probably even in Europe, how do you expect them to, to change in like the near term, mid term future of 20 yeah. years or so? Like some examples would be helpful. Yeah. So it's my, my sort of arrival at the subject is interesting. Unlike Benjamin, I'm not a lifelong environmentalist. I've, I've lived my whole life in New York. I've never thought of myself as a nature person. I've never gone hiking or camping. I've never owned a pet. Um, I really spent most of my adult life thinking that modern life um, especially like the, the world of New York City, was a kind of fortress against the forces of nature. And I had a sort of a awakening a few years ago when I started really looking at the science, and it sounds like a naive revelation, I'm sure you had it much earlier than I did, but no matter how, no matter how deeply you live in a kind of developed man-made 
infrastructure, you are still subject to the laws of nature and still live within the climate, which governs everything that we do. And you understand that more the deeper you look at the climate research when you see that you know economists believe if we stay on the path that we're on, by the end of this century, global GDP will be 30% smaller than it would be without climate change, which is an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Depression, and it would be permanent. Um, there could be places on the planet that would be hit by six climate-driven natural disasters at once. We could have agricultural yields that were half as bountiful as the ones that we have today, and we'd be using them to try to feed probably 50% more people. Um, we probably have twice as much war as we have today because there's a relationship between temperature and conflict. Um, mosquitoes that carried malaria traditionally just in the tropics will be flying as far north as the Arctic Circle. Um, cities of South Asia and the Middle East, some of them 10 or 12, 15 million people strong, will be practically speaking unlivably hot in summer um, as soon as 2050, which is one reason why the UN thinks we'll probably have as many as 200 million climate refugees by then, just by 2050. They think it's possible we could have a billion climate refugees by 2050, which is as many people as today live in North and South America combined. Um, I think when you take the sort of full scope of all of these impacts, you realize that whatever you've, you know, whatever you learned, whatever you've heard about um, climate change processed through the, the question of sea level rise, which is really how it was often talked about for decades before now. That's really just, so to speak, the tip of the iceberg. And that this is truly an all-encompassing system, which will touch, which is to say damage, nearly every human life on the planet. And as I said before, I do think that we're adaptive and resilient enough to find some way to live in these new conditions. But the transformations will be so dramatic if we don't change course soon, that it will really fundamentally reshape our politics, our geopolitics, our culture, our sense of our place in nature, our relationship to technology, and I think maybe even most profoundly, I, may, I say this perhaps because I'm a, a sort of child of the 1990s in, in the US, but most profoundly maybe our sense as relatively well-off Westerners that um, history traces a course of progress and that the future is likely to be more prosperous and more just um, than the past. I think that's a very fundamental presumption that almost all of us raised in the West over the past few decades have. And I think um, unless we change course on climate very soon, um, the damages will be so total that we have to, we'll have to start calling those presumptions into fundamental question. You had this amazing part um, about how the bacteria um, uh, that are part of our bodies um, could potentially change their character due to um, rising average temperatures. And so what was the case with these animals dying out? Yeah, this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a, in some ways it sh I shouldn't have even put it in the book because it's not about humans. And in general, I wrote the book, I say, as like a human chauvinist. I'm much less interested in ecosystems as ecosystems than I am in the way that climate change will affect human life. But this one case study so terrified me. Um, it's the story of the, they're called Saiga antelope. They're kind of a dwarf antelope. They live primarily in Siberia. And um, one summer in 2015, they were essentially wiped off the map. And that happened because the summer was unusually hot and humid. And this bacteria that lived in their digestive tract had lived in their digestive tract for millions of years, um, changed their behavior, and went from being a bacteria that was kind of symbiotic and cooperated with the digestion in the, um, within the antelope um, became a kind of a um, pathogen and wiped out the entire species. This was one summer's temperature change. And we know from recent research in human biology, this is one of the sort of new areas of inquiry over the last few decades, that each individual human is a quite complicated biological system. We think of ourselves as autonomous units, but in fact, we house millions or even billions of bacteria and viruses, which do everything for us. They, they help us digest, that's part of it, but they also regulate our moods. They're related to um, mental illness. There's nearly, nearly nothing that happens in the human body is done without the aid of some of these um, foreign bodies. And I don't think it's likely that, say, a temperature rise of one or two or three degrees Celsius is going to transform all of those bacteria and viruses. Probably most of them will be able to survive that change. But the chance that one or two or three in those millions or billions are transformed is, I would have to say, relatively high. And it may be already the case that we're seeing some of that changing. Um, I mean, 
we're both fathers of, of young kids. And so my daughter had this question to you, um, whether she must die soon. And um, she's five years old. Um, she just overheard some conversation I was having at home during the research I did for the story, which is the, this evening. Um, and how do you, what do you, what are you planning to tell your children that you're raising about what you're, what you're seeing here? How, how, what do you think are the critical skills or the, what is the critical information that you want to give and transfer to your children? I think the most important thing is to try to teach empathy because I think the great risk of a world facing ecological catastrophe is that we um, respond to perceptions of resource scarcity by looking out more and more selfishly for ourselves. And I think it's important in a moral way that we do whatever we can to try to concern ourselves as much with the suffering of people in say India and Bangladesh as the people who live right next to us and even to the extent that it's possible as the people who are in our own families. Um, I think that's hard and I think we are failing today already. We failed that test for many generations, maybe even all of human history. Um, but I worry that we're going to fail it even more dramatically in the decades ahead. And I, I, wanna, I, want, to evo I want us to evolve a politics and a culture that um, responds with more warm-heartedness mm. to the people who are suffering elsewhere in the world and, to try, and that tries to take action to avert some catastrophic outcomes so that people elsewhere won't suffer so much. Um, but, you know, I mentioned um, already, nine million people are dying every year from air pollution. And, you know, you and I and the people we know don't seem especially concerned about that fact. Um, those lives are defined by our culture as not that much worth worrying over because they're concentrated in India and China. Um, and similarly with the intense heat that's being felt in India, the flooding in Bangladesh, these are um, extreme weather phenomena that if they were happening in our nations would inspire unbelievable um, public response. And yet it's only now that some extreme weather is happening in a very minor way in places like the US and the UK and Germany that we're starting to see any kind of mobilization at all on climate. Um, and that really worries me. I would like to think that we can develop a world in which we're concerned about people elsewhere as much as we're concerned about the lives close to us. And I hope that my daughter and her generation will live up to that hope. So but I think it's an open question and there are reasons to be skeptical. Given the three years of, of intense reading, I mean, we must point out this is not a scientific conference. This is about like how will we as, as humans react to this uh, dangerous future we might imagine or we are seeing coming. Um, so what kind of warming, you're not the IPCC, you're free to speak in whatever direction, you're not any political body. What, what kind of warming do you expect up until 2100? So we're always talking about two degrees. We named this conference three degrees plus Celsius. Um, but there's also talk of four or five degrees. What, where are we heading for right now and what do you think will? Well, I think it's a complicated question to answer because the main variable is what humans do. There will be a point at which we've added so much carbon to the atmosphere and so much warming has happened that feedback loops are triggered that um, take control, take power away I from us. I know it's unforeseeable and I don't want to push you into that, but we are currently we're on a path to water. Well, I would say the scientific consensus, it depends a bit. The, what the, the IPC says that the, the highest path of what's called representative concentrated pathways um, takes us to about 4.3 degrees this century. There's some, there's some dispute about whether that's, um, that remains a valuable pathway because it assumes a quite dramatic expansion of coal power, which most um, energy experts now say is unreasonable. On the other hand, we're already seeing some natural feedback loops kick in that may contribute more right, than that right. coal growth would, this is getting technical. But 
essentially, I think at the moment, we're still in a position, and some of the people who are gonna speak later, I think feel a little more pessimistic about this, but at the moment, I, I think that we're still in a position where we may remain the main drivers of climate change. And so, personally, I think that um, it's, it's really hard to project. If I had to guess, if I had to personally bet, I would say that by 2100, we'll probably be at about three or 3.2 degrees of warming. Right. But it's conceivably within our power to avert as much as a degree or more of that. And it's also within our power to do absolutely nothing and let things run quite out of control. If we've, if we've passed over two degrees, which is like the benchmark for catastrophic warming, some say, others say 1.5, and who really knows? If we, if we, what's the difference between three and four degrees? I mean, I can't imagine. What, what would be, give me an example of what would be the difference for well, your for, hometown? Or for, the, for instance, um, One degree of warming, um, it's estimated, uh, could increase war globally by as much as um, 40%. Um, one degree of warming could cut crop yields by um, 15% or 20%. Um, I don't mean from zero to one. I mean at every, every one of those benchmarks. So the difference between three and four degrees could conceivably be um, 40% more war, could conceivably be 20% less food. Um, on the wildfire front, it could mean um, going from, um, I know the data in the American West best, but going from, so at the moment, um, we're already, we have wildfires that are like 10 times bigger than we had um, in the middle of the last century. By mid-century, when we'll be at about two or two and a half degrees, probably wildfires will be as much as four times worse as they are today. But if we get all the way to four degrees, they could be 64 times worse than they are today. Because for every degree of warming, there's a quadrupling of, um, of wildfire acreage burned in the American West. On the other hand, some scientists say that's irresponsible speculation because at that point, so much of the American West would have burned that we need to understand what new ecology would develop in its aftermath. Mm -hmm. And since it will have been entirely burned over, we can't say what plant life would exist. Therefore, we can't make projections about what, how much it would burn. What, what's, the, the, what's the worst news that you're hoping to not hear? Like after reading into all this like terrible you know, stuff, um, what's the one thing that you don't want to see popping up on CNN right now? Or? I think the thing that everybody in the climate world is most panicked about is um, methane being released from melting permafrost. Um, so there's twice as much carbon stored frozen in the northern latitudes of the world as exists in the atmosphere, which means theoretically if that was released in a sudden way, even just as carbon dioxide, it could triple the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and a lot of it, it's expected, will be released not as carbon dioxide, but as methane, which is another um, carbon-based greenhouse gas. And methane stays in the atmosphere not for not nearly as long. It dissipates much more quickly than carbon dioxide. But f while it's up there, it's as much as, um, depending on how you count, 30 or 80 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. And the worry is that if we get enough of that in a short amount of time, even if it will only last for a decade or two, um, that it will push, push us past some of these thresholds that will um, you know, trigger these feedback loops which will bring warming sort of outside of our control. What, when, when, that, when, you, when you read that news on, on, on TV, uh, when you see it on TV, will you like knock at his door or buy some, yeah. some, some piece of land somewhere? You know, I, 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 I'm fully prepared to believe that I'm a sort of naive, at my heart naive, like optimist. Um, I don't think that civilization will collapse at really any of the levels that we're likely to see this century, possibly next century. Um, so I don't think that in my own lifetime I'm going to be dealing with um, you know, a 28 days later scenario or um, a mm -hmm. walking dead scenario. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we, we fool ourselves in thinking that these are binary questions and either civilization will endure or it won't. The truth is pressures are going to mount. There's going to be, um, there could, at the moment we have sort of perceptions of resource scarcity, but in short order we could be dealing with genuine resource scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, there will, that will produce a lot more pressure and conflict and make life a lot more, um, a lot more difficult to enjoy. And um, I think that we'll still be living in cities like the ones that we live in, in apartments like the ones that we live in, and um, have a lot of the same expectations in our day-to-day -day lives as we have today, but the broad contours of expectation for what the world can give us and what the future holds will be really dramatically transformed 
I think it's fair to say that they're already being dramatically transformed, mm -hmm. but certainly at three or four degrees, we'll be dealing with a very different politics, a very different culture. So just in a sentence, what was the biggest change in mind you had during your research? What, what assumption like fundamentally changed for you? The really profound revelation I had was just about how fast this is happening. You know, I was, you know, again, I was sort of raised to think that climate change was a slow process. James Hansen, who's sort of the most outspoken, alarmist American climate scientist, his book for a popular audience is called Storms of My Grandchildren. That was the timeline that we were taught to expect, that this was something that even if it happened, was going to happen at the end of the 21st century into the 22nd century. And scientists even often complained that climate change was happening so slow that nobody would be motivated to take action about it. But half of all of the emissions that have ever been produced in the entire history of humanity have come in the last three decades. A quarter of all emissions that have ever been produced in all of the millennia that humans have been around have come just since the iPhone was released. We are doing this damage very much in mm. real time. This is not dealing with the legacy of the, of the Industrial Revolution. It is literally dealing with the legacy that we are leaving behind every day. And we're seeing that damage now for the first time in real time. So what would be, do you think like, you know, you were talking about, you know, physical climate effects actually happening and you were separating it from our perception, you know, perceived scarcity. Um, do you think the current political climate is somehow, even on the right, indirectly um, influenced by the perception of potential scarcity? Well, I would say if you were to project what a climate geopolitics would look like, it would look like um, a sense of zero of resource scarcity producing a grow you know a growing focus on zero sum calculations about power um, producing in more intense nationalism and nativism and sense of individual self interest and when you look at you know the leadership of people like Donald Trump or Jair Bolsonaro um, Vladimir Putin even you know Erdogan and um, the whole populist movement that we're seeing I think lines up quite closely with what you would expect to emerge in a climate world. I don't know if I would draw the causal lines and say that they are the result of warming, mm -hmm. but I think um, it's probably the case that, at least in some parts of the world, we're likely to see an intensification of those, of those same um, political phenomena, and probably, at le again, at least in some parts of the world, um, those, those trajectories are going to get worse. Just Two more questions, and everyone knows there'll be like time to ask questions in the end. Um, just quickly, what would be the silver bullet sort of like, what would be the best news that you could read? Um, well, climate those change? are sort of two different questions. I tend not to think that this is a problem that we can solve through a single solution. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of people want there to be a single technological innovation or a single political project that is going to solve the problem entirely. And when you understand just how pervasive the problem is, which is to say every aspect of modern life has a carbon footprint and we need to reimagine how we do everything to zero out on carbon, that's not just energy production, that's only about 35 or 40% of the problem, it's also um, transportation and industry and infrastructure and agriculture, um, each of which pose actually more difficult challenges than electricity, which is at the moment probably the easiest one to solve. Um, you realize this is a, a problem that demands a, you know, an everything, uh, take all solutions, take all approaches kind of um, response, okay. not a silver, single silver bullet. But if I were to say the thing that would make me, in the short term, um, most excited to read in the news would be, uh, let me, I'll say two things. The first is sort of a global end to coal production and coal use, um, which the market is actually doing quite good on that front. Um, in most parts of the world, coal is now uh, more expensive than, than, dirty, than clean energy. Um, and governments are starting to respond, and that's really positive. Um, still in China, they've already approved six times as many coal plants just in the first six months of 2019 right. as they approved in all of 2018. So there are problems there. And then the second thing is the, um, I would really like to see a total end to um, subsidies for the fossil fuel business, which is, you know, the IMF, which is no lefty environmental group, says that globally we're subsidizing fossil fuels $5.3 trillion a year. Um, there's no reason for us to be supporting businesses that are poisoning the planet when we could be 
you know, directing that money in part towards renewables that could replace fossil fuels and in part towards investment in innovation, research and development that could allow us to say, you know, develop new forms of um, airplanes that fly on zero carbon fuel or new agricultural practices that could allow us to um, grow meat without producing carbon, et cetera. Yesterday you said something really beautiful. You said a China, a Chinese American partnership to combat climate change. That would be your like science well, that's, fiction. Yeah, that's, you're asking me for like a, 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 what would be the most hopeful thing that could possibly happen. Right. I'm not saying that this is all realistic, but um, <laughs> yeah, the US and China are together um, responsible for almost half of all carbon emissions. They're also the two most powerful countries in the world, politically and economically. And um, we saw with the failure, I would say it's the failure of the Paris Accords in which no industrial nation on earth is on track to honor its commitments under Paris, um, that a kind of uh, an approach forged in the old liberal international um, order is unlikely to succeed. I think that it's possible that an, um, an initiative led by the world's two most powerful countries in a quite aggressive way could produce a better outcome. Right. But that's not to say I think that there's much chance of that happening. Okay, given that you've realized actually how fast this is changing and how little time is left. Um, a couple of you know, uh, recent ecological environmentalist movements, like uh, the climate strikes around Greta Thunberg or Extinction Rebellion, um, and there are also some activists who were pushing for a hunger strike who are present today, um, are, are trying to push the panic button. And here's my main fear, is it good to be panicking in a situation that might probably need much of a calm, coordinated approach. So what do you think about this? What, should we push the panic button? Is this right? I think it's, you know, we need to change course dramatically. For decades, the sort of technocrats who ran the world told us that climate change could be solved through meliorist approaches through marginal approaches, technocratic approaches. And we've seen over the course of those decades, not just no progress, but um, the whole world moving in the wrong direction with more emissions every year. I think we need a dramatic change of course. And I think that, <laughs> I, think that fear, I think that fear and alarm are productive in signaling that necessity. Um, I think that probably there are some people out there who, for whom um, a real sense of panic will push them to a place of psychological despair and disengagement. And I think that's not ideal. But when I look around the world, I see so many more people, so many more countries, so many more cultures that are fatally complacent about this issue than I see people who are on the brink of too much despair or too much panic. And so I think if really raising the alarm um, pushes some people over the brink into fatalism, but it produces a much broader based sense of urgency, that bargain is very, very much worth taking. Wow, thank you so much. Now there's a 10 minute break, sharp 10 minute. Thank you so much, David Wallace Wells, Benjamin Green. Thank you so much. Thank you, applause.